The west coast of Central America is the gateway to the vast expanse known as the Pacific Ocean. And down in the Pacific, some 500 kilometers from Costa Rica, is a place known to many only through myth and legend, Cocos Island. So when did you first hear of Cocos? As a Costa Rican, it's something that's like a legend. Everybody tells you about it and you hear it in the news, you hear it on TV. It's like this mystical place where only a few people go. I, I can't even believe it's a real place right now. <laughs> it's crazy. Imagine the tropical island setting of shipwreck stories and pirate movies. That's Cocos Island. But we're heading there because it's also the setting for one of the most amazing congregations of marine life. A variety of fish, turtles, and especially sharks. For many of these animals, like the endangered scallop hammerhead shark, Cocos is a valuable rest stop as they move from one place to another in this vast open ocean. We're in the eastern tropic of Pacific, 200 kilometers from Cocos Island where we're heading. It's a vast place. For 24 hours, we've seen nothing but ocean all around. The Pacific is so vast, it holds about half of all the ocean water in the world. What strikes me is, that's the land and that's yes. the ocean. Yes. <laughs> it also blows my mind how you can grab Costa Rica like this and just lay it like almost one and a half times. <laughs> oh, that's true. And it's the distance to, to Coco is almost one and a half times. That's Costa right. Rica, yeah. The Pacific is so large that you could fit actually all the continents into it and then there would still be room for a Canada or two. It's a very big place. The majority of the Pacific is what's called the open ocean. Open ocean is that portion of the ocean that lies beyond the continental shelf. The continental shelf is actually part of the Earth's crust that makes up landmass. But it's the underwater portion around the land. Coastal waters above the shelf are relatively shallow. But once you hit the open ocean, it gets deep, super deep. We've left the continental shelf, yeah, which is exciting. And you can it's see the, the drop off is pretty steep right here. Right. It's still 100 meters, and here it's 500, and then 3,000. And it's so easy to see with the map how quickly it changed. Y esto es más, más que todo por la, la zona de subducción, que son dos placas tectónicas que chocan, y entonces hacen que una pase por debajo de la otra. Y el, un pedacito de la otra empuja hacia abajo. Entonces tenemos aquí un de repente es muy profundo el mar. So what I think about 3,000 meters, what does that mean? That's six times the CN Tower, which is the largest building in Canada. Wow, and that's which, quite a lot. was the largest that's building in the world. And incredible. You stack it over six times. That's quite a bit. <laughs> it's deep. That's it's almost too deep. big to imagine. The distance from land, the extreme depths, and the host of other unique features are what make the open ocean very different from the coastal waters we're familiar with. Out here, migration is a common survival strategy among many species. Migration is not an easy thing to define. From the perspective that we're looking at, it's a long distance movement that has a certain amount of predictability about it. Whales, turtles, sharks, they're just some of the species in the ocean that take part in long migrations. So why do some marine animals migrate? Adults move to spawning grounds and then they spawn and then the juveniles move off to nursery grounds where they grow and they reach a certain size and they move to the adult grounds. And so you have migration between these three areas. As you grow in the marine environment, your needs are going to be different, especially in terms of food. Our mission is to track the movements of these animals so we can better safeguard their migratory pathways. The more we know about where they go, when and why, the better we can be at helping ensure the journey is safe for years to come. <laughs>